Welcome back to Open Line, talking about safety in schools. Of course, today was first day of schools for Metro schools. Many kids across the entire state are going back to school this week. Um, the governor put together a safety working group. We have with us the Commissioner of Homeland Security, David W. Perkey, and Bryce Allen, Office of Homeland Security Supervisory Agent. Um, you were both on this working group. You both came up with these recommendations. And um, it's good to know that a lot is being uh, done as far as the safety in our schools because it affects all of us. Let's uh, let's go to Bob here on line one. Hello, Bob. Oh yeah, I think it's a good program. Uh, I'm, I think they're doing a, a great job as far as the safety officers, the lockdowns. Uh, they're even uh, doing laws now concerning uh, the women and being 18, at least 18 years old, concerning that stuff. There's a lot of the, uh, the, the I don't want to say boy, dudes use guns to, uh, you know, can defend their position, and that's a problem. They're get, where they're getting the guns, stuff like that. Uh, my dad was a judge. He said they're just not thinking, and so I think uh, you're doing a great job. Just need to think out some more venues on that stuff. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll let y'all talk about that. Bob, thank you for the call. All right, what I'm going to take from that call is drills. Okay, he he talked a little bit. I think he said something about drills and that kind of thing. What What is being done um, as far as prevention and local law enforcement and, and even drills in the schools? I guess let's talk about drills. Uh, Bryce, I'll let you take that. The law actually requires <coughs> that schools conduct mandatory drills throughout the course of the year. Now we address several different drills, of course. You know, fire drills are in there, but active shooter or violent intruder drills are part of the mandatory drills that our schools are required to perform now. And it can be done at several different levels. Um, we encourage them to involve their local law enforcement, of course, because that's going to be their primary responder in the event of an actual incident. So the goal is to for schools to work with their first responders and establish how they're going to be able to, to measure their response and how they're able to work together. And that's the purpose of these drills. And we've, we've seen great success with them so far. I think they've had drills already, right? Didn't yes. they start doing them toward the end of last year? We did some Active last shooter year. shooter drills. That's correct, yes. We did some last year. We took, uh, my agency took part in several of them and helped out the local law enforcement kind of facilitate that drill. Um, in addition to that, we've seen some schools already doing drills now. They've already started within that first week of school conducting their drill in order to put everybody on that, that sheet of, you know, same sheet of music on how to deal with the problem. What is the, the, the law, I guess? Do they have to do one a, a quarter or one a month or is there is there some set amount they have to do uh, I'm not sure the specific amount I believe if I'm correct I believe they have to do one at the beginning of the year and then part way through the year they have to do one in addition to all the other drills right. that, that are already mandated by law I mean I, I saw one and it's it's really I'm glad they're doing it but it's just depressing that, that we have to we've come to that it's pretty weighty it is it is very weighty and, and I think when I saw the drill being done it was right after one of these shootings and, and again you're glad they're taking the precaution but it just it kind of just breaks your heart that we're having to even do it um, well you know you want to be realistic for the kids um, but particularly younger kids we never want to scare younger kids but we have we want them to be realistic that something could happen and that if they follow instructions and do things right that they're going to be okay I mean, that's, that's what we want to instill in them. Uh, we know uh, there are a lot of things that happen every day in life that we're not comfortable with. Um, I can tell you that in this job, uh, particularly with a statewide responsibility, I hear about something every day that I just can't hardly fathom that's happened. But I, I'm a realist. And I understand that those things happen. And it's incumbent upon us to respond in ways that uh, protect people's lives. And the fact is, when those parents or that school bus drops those kids off at school, they're in the charge of, of a government agency, if you will. And one of the primary responsibilities of government is to protect its people. Uh, when I was a mayor, I was keenly aware of that. If your people don't feel safe, nothing else matters. So I would say the same thing here. Uh, it's incumbent upon us to do everything we can, and we feel like we're doing that. Uh, some would say that an active shooter incident in schools is low probability but high impact. Right. We know that they don't happen as often as you think. 
but boy, the impact is tremendous. So that's what we're trying to guard against. And the impact is so great that, yeah, I think there are times that you feel like, is it going to happen at my school? You see it on TV, and it's so pervasive, it's just overwhelming. Um, it's good to know that it's, it's being thought about at the very highest levels, and there's a lot of work going on. Um, let's go to Tommy. Hello, Tommy. Yes. Go right ahead. What's on your mind? Uh, I, I apologize. I just tuned in, so you might have already discussed this, but um, I've seen a product out there that actually barricades the door. And so until the, um, the authorities are able to get there, the police department's able to get there, if you do have an active shooter and you need to barricade yourself in place, there are products out there. Have, have, have you guys discussed products like that as far as barricading your door? I don't know if I can mention the company, but I, I, ha I saw one on LinkedIn, and so I knew about it, and that's why I'm calling in. All right. Um, we have not talked about that. What about those types of issues? Well, I'll let Bryce help me again, but, but to Tommy's question, excellent point. Um, big topic of discussion. In fact, before the working group was formed, I was called to the Capitol one day to meet with the deputy governor and a local school system in Tennessee. And they had concerns that state fire marshal regulations did not allow them to secure classrooms. It was a very intense meeting where the state fire marshals wanted to do the right thing. They were very understanding of what this system wanted to do, but it did not meet fire codes. Out of that, and the working group itself, the Commissioner of Commerce and Insurance and her staff, where the fire marshal's office is located, um, recognized the changing threat matrix and actually changed their policies and regulations to allow flexibility in the fire codes to secure those classrooms. It's a big point of discussion. The fire marshal's office, even though they were not a direct member of the working group, attended every meeting. Uh, they were very understanding. They realized that they needed to change also and I commend the commissioner and her staff for that. Fire codes are pretty rigid. They're not easy to deviate from, but they found a way to allow some flexibility there with the systems. Systems are very happy about that, and uh, we're seeing that flexibility come into play now. Bryce, I don't know if you have anything. Uh, the locking, the ability to lock a room, the ability to barricade, all these things were looked at in the physical security assessments. That was one of the things that we asked every individual school to take a look at. Did they have the capability to secure their classrooms? Whether that was the primary locking mechanism, whether that was a secondary device, that was something we asked them to address. And there's a number of excellent devices out there on the market. The only thing we ask, of course, is that they're critical when they look at those devices and how they function and make sure that people are trained on the proper usage. And that is the appropriate thing to do, right? If there is, God forbid, an active shooter, the, the teacher is to lock the door. Is that right? Or what, what, what is the There's appropriate thing to do? There's a couple different responses that we encourage. Um, because these situations are very dynamic, they're ever-changing, it's very hard to get a read on exactly what is happening. We encourage people that if it is safe for them to evacuate, then to do so. If you're away from the danger, you have the highest probability of surviving it. So that's the first course of action. And of course, you know, there's caveats in there. There's things that you know, may restrict that ability to make that escape. If that's the case, then we encourage people to go into that lockdown or barricade. Find a secure space, wait out the attack, create that wall between you and the bad guys so they can't get you. That's where locking the door, barricading door, that's where that all comes into place. And then last but not least, of course, is if you have no other options available to you, to take some kind of action, fight back. Do mm -hmm. something to try to stop the bad guy from incurring any more uh, injury or harm to anyone else. And of course, that's the, the last course of action that we recommend. We don't ever recommend that lightly right. because there's a lot of risk involved in doing something like that. Wow, okay, let's go to Lucy. Hello, Lucy. Hey, y'all. Hey, what's on your mind? Well, uh, I appreciate uh, all of your conversation so far, gentlemen. I, I really do. I, I feel informed. I feel like you have been thorough. Uh, I appreciate the fact that the state of Tennessee has allowed the fire marshal in there because if somebody does use an explosive device, uh, 
and a fire starts, those poor firemen, they're dedicated to getting people out there. But here's, here's my question of you two gentlemen sitting there. Can you, once again, if you haven't already done it, can you uh, state your background, your work experience, and your credentials for us out there? And I'll hang up and listen to your comments off the line. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, sure. sure. Go ahead, Russ. Um, I have about 25 years in law enforcement and combined military experience. I originally started as a police officer in South Florida. I originally started in patrol like everybody else, worked my way up through homicide. I was a tactical police officer um, before I ultimately moved to Tennessee after about 12 years or so in South Florida. Um, and now I'm up here and of course uh, I'm with Homeland Security and I run their preparedness division. So I primarily focus on training and planning. That is my, my main focus today. And you said you were a, a county mayor. And to Lucy's question, in, in January I'll leave when Governor Haslam leaves at the end of a 38-year career. Um, I have um, done a lot of stuff. Um, I've worked in a hospital. I worked for a judge for six years. I was a local emergency management director. Uh, I've served as a police accreditation manager at my hometown police department, a state trooper, a TBI agent and then I was elected county mayor of my home county for 16 years. I've been in Nashville during the Haslam administration as the governor's homeland security advisor and assistant commissioner of the department until about two years ago when the previous commissioner left and I was named commissioner of the department. And what county were you? In county Hamlin in? County in Morristown in East Tennessee. That's great. You can probably tell by my voice. <laughs> Uh, that's right. All right, we'll take a break. Uh, come back. Uh, if you have a question or comment, give us a call. Take a break. Be back right after this.